Kevin Sullivan was a hermit brother. Those six words so simply stated are really quite profound. I must openly admit after all these years that while I was at St. Augustine Prep, our primary purpose was not the academic education of young men. Sure, there were many smart boys that went on, that went to the prep and did quite well on various measures of intelligence. Many young men received scholarships for their academic or athletic prowess. All of that was just a sideshow to what was the main purpose of the school. Let me say this boldly and unequivocally, that the main purpose of the education of St. Augustine Prep was to produce hermit brothers. The brothers may well forget the function of a quadratic equation. They probably will not remember the date of the Battle of Hastings. I would guess that many of them could not identify an ablative absolute in Latin or the imperative subjunctive in French or Spanish. However, they will never forget hermit brotherhood. Hermit Brotherhood does not get you into a fancy university, and I doubt that anyone received any tuition assistance because of it. The goal of Hermit Brotherhood is lifelong friendships, and to teach one the power of and the need for love. It is the ability after several years to pick up the conversation right where you left off the last time. It does not take too many steps in the conversation to bring a smile to your face when you recall some of the antics of your classmates or teachers. What a hermit brother is always recalling is love. Every hermit brother was loved by a mixture of administrators, teachers, coaches, staff, cafeteria personnel, classmates, and the ever-expanding family of the prep. Kevin Sullivan was a hermit brother. I wrote this note in because I thought of this on my way here, that Kevin brought that hermit brotherhood with him, with Bill, Matt, and Kevin to the uh, to LaSalle in their four there. Sully brought hermit brotherhood to his place of work at Wilbraham, Lawler, and Booba. Sully brought in every photo that you saw his smile the love that he engendered in so many other people, it went wherever Kevin went. I was talking to Coach D'Amico the other day and he recalled that Kevin and the other brothers in the boat really captured what crew and the prep were all about. On the land, it was fun and camaraderie, but it was all business in the boat. Each rower worked for the team, not for himself, that is exactly why Kevin excelled at Hermit Brotherhood. He did not receive money or plaudits or titles. However, he earned his master's degree and doctorate in Hermit Brotherhood. He received the greatest reward of all, love. It amazes me that Kevin could ever have been in a boat called the Lightweight Eight when you consider how many three for a dollar cookies he ate every morning in the cafeteria or how many TCP lunch days were part of his diet. Only Hermit Brothers know immediately that TCP means tricolored pasta with a cream sauce that is all calories and no benefit to your body. It is difficult, if not impossible, to think of a time when Sully was not smiling or happy. Teenage boys do some pretty stupid stuff, and most of the time it is very funny. Kevin would have been right in the mix with those testosterone-laced shenanigans. When I saw him in the hospital recently, he still had that mop of hair that made me envious. Some things never change. Students in an all-boys school rarely, if ever, feel the need to comb their hair, and Sully was all over that. Kevin started out as a soccer kid, and that is where he met his brother from another mother, Bill Smith. It didn't take long for his love of the water and the sports that go with water to draw him into the world of crew. 
I must be honest and tell you that guys who do crew are crazy. There is no reason to put oneself through that. When the spring season begins, in the middle of winter, mind you, a rower puts his foot in the lake as icebergs are floating by, and he learns to love it. And he actually works up a sweat even when the wind chill is minus 20. As I said, these are crazy guys. It makes about as much sense as love. Why do you sacrifice? Why not just think only of yourself? Why do you put yourself through that pain? The joy that Kevin gave in crew is the same joy he gave in life. In December of 2020, as Kevin began his journey, we had a chance to renew our relationship through phone calls and text messages. He was still a hermit brother. We talked about his loves, his family, his girlfriend Angie, and his hermit brothers. We talked about the road ahead, and we prayed together. Due to COVID, we could not meet in person, but we did the best we could. Events would change rapidly. In today's second reading from St. Paul, we listen to the classic description of love. St. Paul wrote it, and Kevin lived it. Sully knew that love was kind and never jealous. He treated those he loved as best he could. He rejoiced with them about their achievements. Love is never rude or selfish. Yes, that is Kevin too. Love is always ready to excuse, to trust, to hope, to endure whatever comes. The love that Kevin doled out in boatloads surrounded and sustained him. Like it or not, we are all now members of a club to which none of us wants to belong, the Society of Sudden Suffering. Once you are a member, you never look at anything the same way. Your values change. What you thought was important is less so. You take nothing for granted. You have a knowledge set that you never wanted, but now must be used to help others. When you enter the society of sudden suffering, you have two choices. The first of these is the road of Sisyphus. Sisyphus is a character from Greek mythology. He was the king of what is modern day Corinth. Sisyphus thought he was more clever than the gods. He suffered from extreme hubris. After having outwitted the gods twice, eventually Sisyphus was sent to the underworld and was condemned to roll a rock up a hill. And every time he got close to the top, the rock would roll back down and he would have to start over again. When you think you know better than a god, this is the price you pay. The punishment of frustration would go on into eternity. In choosing this path, we become modern day Sisyphus. Why did this have to happen? Why did Kevin have to die? If I were God, this never would have happened. We become so angry. We want to punch something. We want answers and we are not getting them. We roll the rock up the hill and after exhaustion, frustration and anger, we find the rock is back at the bottom of the hill and in futility, we begin all over again. The next day and the day after that, and then the day after that. The path of Sisyphus is one of paralysis, anger and depression. I know this path well because I chose it the first time I entered the society of sudden suffering. It was the well-worn way that so many others have walked before and after me. When I was a young priest, my best friend, Tom, had been killed in a car accident. He was 26 when he was killed. He was an innocent bystander in an incident of road rage. I was shocked. I was angry. I was depressed. I asked, how could God allow this to happen? My distress was compounded when Tom's parents asked me to let his brother, Stephen, know that he had been killed. Stephen was in his first year of law school at the University of Penn. 
Stephen and I joined the Society of Sudden Suffering together on that fateful day as we both sobbed endlessly. Recently, when my six-year-old great-nephew passed away suddenly, Stephen called me because he knew the pain of being in and re-entering the Society of Sudden Suffering. He said how bad he felt for me and my niece and her husband. Then he said, we humans think we have a right to answers, but we don't. Stephen knows this from experience. A common first reaction to the death of anyone we love is to blame God. Like Sisyphus, we think we know better. The truth is that God is not in the evil of the accidents or war, of pandemics or plagues, of cancer or, or murders. No, the one who gave us love is not in the source of our pain and loss. Rather, God, who is love, is the source of the healing. He is in the restoration. He is in the peace. After months of rolling the rock up the hill, I realized that I was not getting better. Indeed, I was getting worse. Instead of looking at the great gift of love I had received and thanking Tom for the gift of my, thanking God for the gift of my best friend Tom, I was looking at what I didn't have, my best friend and the love we shared. Somehow, I had the grace to choose the second path, and that is what led to healing. The other choice we have when we enter the society of sudden suffering is to take the path of love. It would not be wrong to call it, to call it the way of Sully. While our first reaction is to look at what we don't have, to look at our loss, eventually we need to realize that we have been blessed. We need to thank God that we have had the presence of such great love in our lives that we have known and been loved by Sully. Is our pain so profound that we would ever say, we wish we had never loved? Of course not. Listen again to the opening lines of that famous passage from St. Paul. I am going to show you a way that is better than any of them. That way is the way of love. We only cry and are sad because we have loved and been loved and now experience the loss of that love. Do not reject that love. Do not let grief overwhelm you and diminish that love. In keeping love alive, we keep Kevin alive. Kevin has shown us the way. Hug your children. Forgive anyone with whom you are at odds. Bring joy and love to our world. And when you do so, let them know that Kevin Sullivan, a hermit brother, has sent you.